Hello, welcome to China Observer. I'm your host, Ben Christensen. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lijian has become the latest hot topic because of a composite photo he posted on Twitter. The picture shows an Australian soldier holding a dagger to the neck of an Afghan child with an Australian flag over his head and the flags of both countries on the ground, hinting at a recent unsubstantiated rumor of Australian soldiers involving the murder of young people in Afghanistan. Australian Prime Minister Morrison strongly condemned China's actions, and even Australian opposition leader Anthony Albanese said he supported Prime Minister Morrison on this occasion. I want to make a brief statement on the repugnant post that has been made today on a Chinese government Twitter account. The post made today, the repugnant post made today, of an image, a falsified image, of an Australian soldier threatening a young child with a knife, a post made on an official Chinese government Twitter account, posted by the Deputy Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr Lijian Zhao, is truly repugnant. It is deeply offensive to every Australian, every Australian who has served in that uniform. Anthony said, Australia's condemnation of this image is above politics, and we all stand as a nation in condemning it. Liberal MP Trent Zimmerman also described such an act as pure rank propaganda. The image, however, has not been censored by Twitter, despite being fake. Twitter simply marked the photo as sensitive information as it quickly became the most trending news on Twitter. The only incident linked to this photo is a November 19th Australian Defence Force report that states there is credible evidence of war crime conducted during the 2012 Afghanistan conflict, which has been referred to the Australian Federal Police. Despite the backfire over the fake photo, another spokeswoman for China's foreign ministry, Hua Chunying, said on November 30th, that the photo had nothing to do with the previous conflict between China and Australia, saying she did not know whose work the altered photo was, but that it had been widely circulated on the internet because it shows the anger of many people. She also said that the public should not overinterpret the message while denying the fact that the photo was first released by her colleagues. This somewhat shows that China does not take this issue seriously and they do not think that there will be consequences for angering Australia. China calls this war wolf diplomacy which means taking the toughest diplomatic stance using strong words but not seeking evidence. In fact, this is just one episode in the recent Sino-Australian conflict as relations between China and Australia have already reached a freezing point. This is evidenced not only by the fact that the leaders of the two countries have not met for three years, but also by the recent series of so-called economic counterattacks China has imposed on Australia. A few days ago, China's Ministry of Commerce decided to impose a temporary anti-dumping measure in the form of security deposit on Australian wine imports by increasing tariffs up to 212% from November 28th. Prior to this, in the past few months, China has suspended beef trade and imposed an 80% tariff on barley. Beijing has also demanded Chinese not to travel, work, or study in Australia, and has called Australia a racist country. Moreover, China continues to conduct hostage threats by executing an Australian man this week on drug smuggling charges after a secret trial in June. In September this year, China has also secretly arrested Australian Chinese journalist Cheng Lei and later used security threats to force two Australian journalists out of China. According to officials, Chinese statements, China's actions were in response to a series of politically motivated actions by Australia against China. These include the Australian government's demand for an investigation into the source of the COVID-19 outbreak that points to China, its response to the U.S. clean network campaign that banned Chinese company Huawei from building a 5G network in Australia, and its designation of the Chinese Communist Party developed organizations in Australia as foreign agents. On November 20th, the day after Australia and Japan signed a military cooperation agreement, the Chinese embassy in Australia released a document listing a series of 14 charges against Australia. Among them were Australian government support for think tanks, anti-China research, investigation of Chinese journalists in Australia, cancellation of Chinese academic visas to Australia, criticism of China's affairs in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Xinjiang, calls for an international investigation 
into the origins of COVID-19, banning Huawei from participating in Australia's 5G network, and banning Chinese investment in Australia on national security grounds and more. Also, China claimed the Australian government is trying to completely destroy the One Belt, One Road agreement between the Victorian government and China. But if you think about it, investigating and revoking the visas of foreigners is something that China has been doing for decades. China officially calls Huawei a private company. Why keep harboring Huawei when it is banned by other countries? Why are Confucius Institutes filled with brainwashing materials for spreading communist ideas? And why not let Australia call for an international investigation into the origins of COVID-19 when China continues to claim there is nothing suspicious? From all of the above, it appears that China has many demands on Australia, but does not care what Australia thinks. Perhaps we can look at it from an economic perspective. The economy is the lifeblood of the country. China has been Australia's largest trading partner for the past 10 years, accounting for 33% of Australia's total exports. Meanwhile, Australia's second largest trading partner is Japan, which accounts for less than half of China's trade. In 2019, China brought more than half of the total barley and 40% of the wine produced in Australia, and is also the largest buyer of Australian seafood, agricultural products, timber, iron ore, coal, and natural gas. Along with trade, Chinese companies have made significant acquisitions in Australia's agriculture, winemaking, and mining industries. Iron ore is a strategic national resource with military value, and China relies heavily on the import of iron ore and has been acquiring minerals overseas for a steady supply. In 2006, when Sino-Australian relations were less cordial, China's Citic Pacific acquired two of mineralogy's iron ore mines from the U.S. for $2.9 billion. From publicly available data, China also acquired stakes in at least four Australian iron ore mining companies between 2008 and 2014. In addition to securing supplies, this will allow these Sino-Australian joint ventures to avoid China's tariff burden and put greater pressure on the Australian companies, which may ultimately be inclined to accept Chinese investment or be acquired by Chinese companies, a win-win situation for China. For other traded products, such as wine, there is another story. A bilateral free trade agreement was signed between Australia and China in 2015, with the two sides agreeing to reduce tariffs on Australian wine exports to China to zero. However, the Chinese government statement issued on November 27th stated it had preliminary ruled that Australian wine exports to China were dumped. Australia protested, stating that Beijing's actions were totally inconsistent with the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement and the agreements reached between the members of the World Trade Organization. Australia's Trade Minister Simon Birmingham also stated that Australia would report the incident to the WTO. China's problem is further than being untrustworthy. The country's influence on Australia is significant in all aspects. Australia is home to more than 1.2 million people of Chinese descent, many of whom are new immigrants with 10 years who have been educated by the Communist Party of China or have strong ties to the party. These behaviors can also be seen in some of the Chinese in Australia who has been described by locals as having no regard for Australian law. to other nation. Do they ask that? Yeah. Just, no, no, no. Only one China. Okay, but are they asking for... So they tell me they don't support them because they're asking for independence because there's one China. Yeah, yeah one China. But they're not asking for independence. Yeah, but like they're part of China, so they should believe in China. Yeah. They, okay, but they do believe in China, they just don't believe in the Chinese communist government is that okay no I don't care. no, no. <laughs> it's not no no of course it's not what, why not i i can say i don't like what the government yeah. is doing and yeah. i'm going to protest like what they're doing exactly what they're doing and i say these are my demands they have five demands none of them are asking for independence is that okay what do you mean by like so these got these hong kong protesters yeah. then they're saying the they're saying Chinese government are not good. Yes, but they're not saying, they're not breaking the law. They're saying this they're just, is... They just like don't think it's good. Certain things within the government. So five demands. They're asking for five demands. They're not asking to not be Chinese. Yeah. They actually all like being Chinese. Yeah. So do you think that that's okay? 
Well, I think if they are actually Chinese, they should believe in Chinese government. In 2018, the Australian state of Victoria attracted media attention when it leapfrogged into signing a One Belt, One Road agreement with China and spent about 37000 to commission the Chinese-founded Australia-China Belt and Road Initiative. Morrison has said he was surprised the Victorian government reached the agreement without any discussion with the federal government, as foreign affairs are constitutionally a matter of the federal government. In the past few years, many experts have pointed out that the Sino-Australian relationship continues this way. Australia will gradually become more and more dependent on China, and eventually plunged into a national crisis. This may not seem like a warning sign to some, but that's all changed earlier this year when the COVID-19 pandemic hit Australia and the world, making people realize that the Chinese Communist Party only cares about its own interests and is not yet satisfied with the status quo. Australia has made some efforts this year to address the issue of economic dependence. Earlier this year, Australia arranged a series of diplomatic engagements with allies including the United States, India, and Japan. Australia is also eagerly seeking trade partnerships with Southeast Asian countries, such as Indonesia and South Korea. However, many of these countries have yet to sign a free trade agreement with Australia. We may say the Chinese Communist Party is taking a gamble. Most Western countries will not try to provoke Beijing at a time of a pandemic and an economic downturn. When they see what happened to Australia, at the same time, Beijing also tries to strengthen ties through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership with several Asian countries, and to boost its sale of vaccines. In the wake of the fake photo incident, many commentators from China have argued that Australia has no ability to fight back because it is inextricably linked to China in all respects. But Australia is not alone. International coalition of resistance to the Chinese Communist Party are now underway, such as the Quad, which includes the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, whose foreign ministers met in October and directly addressed the threat from China and held joint military exercises in the Pacific in November. The Five Eyes has shown signs of resurgence in recent years. The U.S. established the Global Alliance to circumvent the Chinese Communist Party's cyber espionage activities. Up to now, there are already 53 countries and 180 telecommunication companies from different continents have joined the Clean Network campaign in the United States. In Australia, recently, the deputy director of the Australian Chinese History Museum, Yisheng Yang, 65 years old, was named Australia's 2018 China National Reunification Commission for his association with the Chinese Council for the Promotion of Peaceful National Reunification, an agency of the Chinese Communist Party's United Front Work Department. He is the first to be indicated after the passage of the Anti-Foreign Intervention Act. On October 28th, the U.S. Department of State took similar action, listing the National Association for China's Peaceful Unification in Washington, D.C. as a foreign mission. What is the way forward for Australia and the West without China? The Wall Street Journal quoted a U.S. official as saying on November 23rd that they are pushing for a new hardline measures against Beijing. Even as President Trump winds down his final, they would create an informal alliance of Western nations to jointly retaliate when China uses its trading. They say the plan was sparked by Chinese economic pressure on Australia after that country called for an investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. Not only the US, but the EU will also call on the US to seize a once-in-a-generation opportunity to forge a new global alliance to meet the strategic challenge posed by China as reported by the Financial Times on November 30th, citing the EU draft plan. Of course, many actions against the Chinese communist regime are still in the planning stage, but the world has reached a consensus on uniting against the CCP that has never been seen before. Undeniably, this is due to the fact that the US Trump administration's iron fist policy toward the CCP in recent years has greatly increased the confidence of other countries. That's all for today. Thank you for watching China Observer. See you next week.